I'm Ben McKechn, host of the Lord's Prayer podcast with theologian David Honey. We're going to take a closer look at the world's most famous prayer to enrich our own conversations with God through the prayer Jesus himself taught us. Our Father in heaven, your name be honoured as holy. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. In every episode, we will explore a different line, clause of the Lord's Prayer, always with the aims of glorifying God and firing up our own prayer lives. David Honey is a lecturer in Christian thought at Moore Theological College in Sydney, Australia. He also wrote The Last Things, a detailed book about how the Lord's Prayer is a lens for understanding God's purposes for us in Jesus, now and into eternity. This is episode two, and we're getting into the opening line of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, your name be honoured as holy. Or hallowed be your name, if that's the version you've learned off by heart. As we will do in every episode, to help us keep track of what we've been covering, I start off by asking David where exactly we're up to in the Lord's Prayer. I know, I know, we're at the start, but I still had to ask David. He's a good sport. Well, I think we're up to the first line now. (laughs) Yep, correct. You passed. We've established that we're praying to our Heavenly Father. Yes, yep, and we've established um, in the conversation last time that this is how we should pray. Jesus let us know, therefore, you should pray like this, and then goes into what we now describe as the Lord's Prayer. Yes, you're right. We're up to the first line, our Father in heaven, your name be honoured as holy or hallowed as holy. If this is your first time with us on the Lord's Prayer podcast, we're really glad that you're here. But you might not have noticed how I mentioned earlier, this is not the first episode. This is episode two. So wherever you get your podcast, scroll back and check out episode one. David and I had a top conversation about Jesus' own introduction, if you will, to what we call the Lord's Prayer. As we can read in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6, verse 9, Jesus said, therefore, you should pray like this. We don't mind if you duck off and first check out episode one before rejoining us here for episode two. There are so many great and foundational insights offered over there. You don't want to miss them. Our Father, let's just stop there for a moment, David. I imagine you may have some thoughts on how big a deal this is that Jesus says we can pray to God as our Father. Yeah, that, it's a huge deal. No one refers to God as Father like Jesus does. There's a a few references to Israel being God's son and by association he being their father in uh, Exodus and Deuteronomy. And you mean when you describe Israel, the the people of God before before Jesus came on the scene? That's right, in the Old Testament. The Old Testament people of God, there is a couple of references to Israel Israel, the people of Israel being like a son to God and so by association he being like their father, although it's not specifically mentioned. It's not really until God makes a promise with King David about David's son that David's son will be called God's son. 2 Samuel 7. 2 Samuel 7, that's right. God makes a covenant or a promise to David that David's own son will be considered by God to be his son. We can be even more specific than that. In the Old Testament book of 2 Samuel, in chapter 7, God makes some amazing promises to King David. 
Among them is the one David Honey just mentioned where from verse 13 and after a big build up that you definitely should also read, God declares that he will establish the kingdom of one of King David's descendants. This descendant is the one who will build a house for God's name. I will establish his kingdom forever, God states. And here's the bit. I will be his father and he will be my son. This is one of the Bible's most potent promises pointing forward to God's son, Jesus, which David Honey and I will talk more about. But I love here how David sums up this giant moment in the history of relationship with God. Now, that's kind of important because it means that the King of Israel or the Messiah, which is a special word that just means chosen by God, the chosen King of Israel is considered God's son. And so he is allowed to refer to God as his father, although he never does. Yeah. So there's not really records of David's sons or ancestors doing that. There's a whole stack of psalms that are written by David to God, but he doesn't actually refer to God as his father. When Solomon prays at the commissioning of the temple, he still prays to Yahweh, uh, the Lord. Before we keep delving into God as our father in heaven, whose name we should honour as holy, quick sidebar on the significance of Yahweh. Yahweh is the word come to be understood as the name God gave to himself. It first appears in the Bible in Exodus chapter 3, where God speaks to Moses, you've probably heard of him, from the burning bush. You've probably heard of that. David's actually going to refer to this in about 15 minutes time and delve into this name event and its amazing link with Jesus and the Lord's Prayer. But for now, know this, Yahweh expresses the four Hebrew letters that are linked with God describing himself as I will be who I will be or I am. Those four letters are also known as the Tetragrammaton, the Tetragrammaton, getting a little bit Bible nerd now. And David's soon going to expand all this out. The short story is Yahweh, the Lord, is our English language way of trying to say the very name God gave himself. Okay, let's get back to David moving forward to how Jesus addressed God. It's not until Jesus appears on the scene and he starts referring to God as his father that it even becomes a thing. And most of the time, the uh, Jews freak out about it. When you read through John's gospel, uh, in John 5, for example, Jesus refers to God as his father. My father is always working and I am working. And the Jews flip right out because they know that Referring to God as Father is actually, in Jesus' case, making yourself equal with him. It's far too intimate for anyone to refer to the creator of the universe as their father. And yet, what we learned last time is that God sent Jesus into the world to renew our relationship with him so that, as John says in the beginning of his gospel, whoever believed in Jesus, God gave the right to be children of God. Which is still, when you stop and think about it, very difficult to wrap your head around. Like what, 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 what sort of relationship is that that we can have? It's one thing to see Jesus, Jesus as God's chosen son speaking about God the Father. It's another one for me to try to get my head around being called to pray to my Father in heaven. There's two ways we can approach this. Paul talks to the church in Ephesus in chapter 3. In case you don't know, David here is talking about the Apostle Paul, who wrote many of the books in the New Testament, including Romans and Ephesians, a letter, also called an epistle, written to a church that he started in the first century in Ephesus, which we find in modern-day Turkey. 
Paul's the guy who had the road to Damascus conversion. That's recorded in Acts chapter 9. Having persecuted Christians in the years immediately after Jesus' death and resurrection, Paul encountered the risen Jesus on that road to Damascus. He saw the light of the world and he became, was called to be an apostle, a sent one, to share the good news that he had previously been trying to stamp out. He went on to become one of Christianity's most influential figures. Back to David and Ephesians and Paul's use of father in reference to God. Paul talks to the church in Ephesus in chapter 3 uh, when he refers to God as father as really sort of the the analogy or portrait or picture of what earthly fathers, the males in families ought to be like. Uh, and so when we make that kind of association, we get a sense of, well, uh, God provides, certainly in that ancient Near Eastern context, the husband and father provided everything for the uh, for the family. The, he was the business owner or the farmer or whatever it was. Ancient Near Eastern context is a quick, accurate way to summarise the real world geography and history, the where and when of the events recorded in the Bible. So there is that sense of giving life, preserving life, caring for a family. Paul makes those sort of associations to God. That's one way to understand God as Father by surveying how Paul describes him in letters like Ephesians. Another way, according to David, is a special bond. Because of his special relationship with Uh, God as Father, Jesus as the Messiah, the true King of Israel, gathering us into that relationship means that we become God's chosen ones. Not not God's Messiahs, though, not little Messiahs. Not little Messiahs, although some people seem to forget that at times. It just means that we belong to God and uh, we receive a spirit of adoption, which shows that we belong to God as children belong to a father, but to a male parent. Belonging to God as children. That is such incredible news. You are forgiven for wanting to dwell happily on that for some time. Feel free to do that as David and I shift gently back towards the Lord's Prayer and why David thinks Jesus started it in the way he did. To get back to that opening line... Our Father in heaven, your name be honoured as holy. David reminds us about the immediate context of the Lord's Prayer. As he outlined in greater detail back in episode one, just before Jesus instructs his disciples how to pray, at the midpoint of what we now refer to as the Sermon on the Mount that we read in Matthew chapters 5 through to 7, Jesus had called out two other groups of prayers and their prayers. Basically, Jesus said they think that this is the way to address God, but no, it is not. So Jesus says, well, don't be like the professional religious people who are just putting on a show. They have the right words to say, but their attitude is such that they're actually speaking to the people around them. They're not speaking to God as a person, let alone their father. Don't be like them. And don't be like the pagans who just think of anything they can possibly say in the hope of being heard. Repeating it over and over again, Jesus uses the words babbling. Don't babble like the pagans. Pagans is a word that the Bible uses to describe people who worship false gods or follow other religions. Some believe it also extends to those who have no religion at all. Jesus uses the word babbling. Don't babble like the pagans. Instead, do what I do. Refer to God as your father. Huge. Just huge. 
Uh, and also there's a suggestion of priority, isn't there, of starting with our Father as the first words out of your mouth in this prayer that Jesus teaches us. Yeah, that's right. It's what we might call in our common parlance a sign of respect. We respect the one to whom we are speaking, uh, acknowledging the privileged status that we have in addressing God, uh, acknowledging all that God has done for us in making us, in saving us through Jesus. So that term father carries with it all those sort of colours. And what about in heaven? And Like whereabouts is heaven and is God the Father always there? Well, in the... Uh, In the times in which the Bible was written, the universe is kind of divided up into three layers. There's heaven, which is sort of above the clouds. That's where God dwells, where the angels are present with God. Then there's the earth, the bit that we get around on and have our life. And then there's the bit under the earth. That's where the dead go. Maybe there's evil spirits there as well. There's kind of chaos going on. But that's sort of three layers are the first century description of the universe. God is our heavenly father as distinct from an earthly father. So is it still helping us to remember respect for and correct prioritisation of God the father, like as in above us, beyond us, Mm, but also connected with us? God is so far above us in every way because he's actually the source of all life in the universe. He's not just another part of the universe. He is actually the source of all life outside the universe. And yet such is his love for us that he sends his son into the universe to become a creature in his own creation so that he can be accessible to us which could be in total contrast with someone's earthly dad who they may not have a relationship with or even worse, like treated them horrendously in like dramatically start, the biggest contrast you could possibly draw. That's what God, your father, is at the other end of the spectrum to that. Well, we always have a relationship with our creator. It's either a good one or a bad one. There's no sense in which we don't have a relationship with him. Through Jesus, we can have a good relationship with God, our creator, and not just a, uh, an effective, beneficial one, but a, a genuinely intimate and personal one, like the best form of earthly father could be. At this point in our conversation, I'm so trying to process and chew on all the top tidbits that David is offering up that the simple equation he just summed up sort of passes me by, but it shouldn't have. As we slow down to reflect meaningfully on our relationship with the Heavenly Father, remember, we always are in relationship with the one who made us. And it's either good or not. And the one way to good relationship with God the Father is through God the Son, Jesus. We've got this far in our conversation without me asking David about God the Father's name being honoured as holy. As in, I'm thinking that God has plenty of different names and titles as demonstrated in the earlier sidebar about Yahweh. Even though God as Heavenly Father is the immediate context, is that the name in focus? David, help. Which name does Jesus want to be honoured? Well, in uh, Paul's letter to the Philippians, he gives us a, a really special clue of how this part of the prayer works out. Paul tells the Philippians in chapters 2 verses 5 to 11 that we should have the mind of Jesus, who though being in very nature God did not account equality with God something to be grasped, but humbled himself taking on the form of a servant. If you read through that passage in verses 10 and 11, because Jesus uh, suffered death on the cross for our sake, 
It says in verse 10, The Father exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, the Lord word that's uh, mentioned in our English translation of our Bibles is actually an English translation of the name that God gives to Moses way back before uh, the Prince of Egypt movie starts or <laughs> right at the beginning of the Prince of Egypt story. When Moses I forgot had, that was in the Bible, Prince of Egypt. That's right. <laughs> right back at the, uh, the beginning of the uh, story there, Moses is out in the desert and he comes across a tree that's burning. He goes to see what's going on and God speaks to him out of the fire of the tree calls him over to him, says, Moses, I've got a special job for you. I want you to go to Egypt and bring my people out because I'm going to save them from slavery. Moses says, okay, who should I tell these people has sent me? And God says, well, I will be who I will be. That's the kind of English translation of a word that we think means Yahweh or a funny old English version of it is Jehovah. It's the name that God gives of himself for the people of Israel, which because the people of Israel considered that to be such a privilege to know God's name, they didn't use it. Uh, and so it's, mm, Out of such respect, they would not let because it... Because they didn't want to be familiar, uh, didn't want to kind of pretend that they had any power over God. So in our Bibles we see Lord uh, inserted in that instead of uh, this. Often in capital letters, that Lord, That's right. yes. That's right. Yes. Well, that name Lord is given to Jesus. That's the one Paul's referring to. That's right, that name. In so Jesus, when we say that Jesus Christ is Lord, we're saying Jesus is the one who promised to save his people. And in that uh, passage in uh, Philippians, Paul says, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That, I take it, is the explanation of how the first line of the Lord's Prayer is fulfilled. Jesus says, pray, our Father in heaven, your name be hallowed, treated as holy, treated as special on earth as it is in heaven. Well, Paul tells us that will happen when every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's like a mic drop moment. Let's just take a little moment to consider what David has just brought together. God the Father and God the Son, honoured as the Lord's prayer extols, when the Son is worshipped rightly as Lord to bring glory to Yahweh, the Lord God. Have you ever prayed that first line and registered that you are praying for that. Me either. Just take a moment to ponder such majesty and marvelousness. Now, in all this excitement about honouring the name of God the Father in God the Son, we've somewhat skipped over what honour and honouring is. David? Holiness is a few different things. Uh, it's separateness. Uh, so the people of Israel had to be a holy people and so they separated themselves from the, na uh, from the nations. It's specialness. So the particular, um, say the particular uh, materials made up the tabernacle and the uh, sacrificial instruments that were used there, they were holy, so they're specially for that purpose. Uh, and, of course, then holy has the sense that only God has is completely other, sort of far above. There's a big English word, transcendent, which just means right out of this universe kind of big. Yeah, that's pretty big. Holiness means all those things. So God's name will be treated special. It will be treated honourably as different from everyone else and wholly other stupendous. 
Don't you just love to hear about the holiness of God? So grand, wonderful. Having surveyed the rich and relational territory of the first line of the Lord's Prayer, I want to get David's thoughts on how this lands for us. Towards the end of every episode, David is going to share practical and applied wisdom and examples to each section of the Lord's Prayer. So you might want to take notes or more notes because you've already been taking some. So now let's hone in on impact with David because it's one thing to talk about the start of the Lord's Prayer. It's another to pray it with conviction and expect something actually will happen. We are asking that our Heavenly Father's name be honoured as holy, after all. So, David, when I come to pray this and sincerely mean it, what sort of personal impact will this line have? Like, will will God's name be honoured as holy now? Or is this sort of pointing forward to a future time when, as Philippians is pointing to, every knee will bow to Jesus when he's rightfully understood to be Lord? Do you know what I mean? I'm, I'm talking about the living, as we all live in this life now, but as we await eternity, what's the personal impact of this line for me as I pray it? Well, the personal impact of it is that now Jesus is Lord. On the day of Pentecost, uh, when Peter spoke to the crowds and told them uh, why the Holy Spirit was being poured out uh, on all those who heard, he finished off his uh, sermon by saying, that man, Jesus, whom you crucified, God has made both Lord and Messiah. You can read that in Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 2, verse 36. Close. Where that uh, (laughs) that actual line comes from. But when we call Jesus Lord, and that is we pray to Jesus as our Lord, as the one who owns us, as the one who to whom we belong, as the one we serve and when we obey, uh, the one we love and to whom we're devoted, we show that, in, of course, in the way that we pray. But as we do that, as we call upon Jesus as our Lord, not just our Saviour, we are in fact hallowing God's name. We're treating it as holy, as honourable and worthy uh, and worshipful. That's not a real word, but you know what I mean. (laughs) Sounds good though. I like it. What about on a corporate level? Now that could be across an individual church or across churches or even more broadly, like across a nation. What sort of impact might it have if so many of us at least were starting to pray From the bottoms of our heart, our Father in heaven, your name be honoured as holy. Well, uh, at one level, it's admitting a fact that's already in place. God's name is holy because Jesus bears it for us. So at one level, what we're all saying is we think that's true. Yeah, even though so many of us, I think some Christians included, cannot live like that, cannot use God's name like that, cannot approach God in, I wouldn't describe it as holy at all. No, but that's the grace of God that Jesus stands for us. I'm glad David answered like that because, poor, I sure was sounding a bit judgy there about how some other Christians over there can approach God without due reverence. I didn't mean to have such a tone or sneer. The grace of God in that Jesus stands for us, as David just said, is certainly something I always I always need to rely upon, including during this conversation with David when I mention those Christians over there. Let's let David remind us all, myself included, about why we trust not in our own steam or judgments, but in the one who taught us the Lord's Prayer. When we trust that Jesus is our Lord and Saviour, It comes back to what we were talking about last time. Jesus is a mediator between us and God, and God has put him there for our sake. When we look to Jesus as our Lord, in the midst of all our crappiness, can I say crappiness? I can't really say crappiness. Yeah, no, you just did. All the sludge that makes up our less life uh, that we carry around with us, some of which others know, 
most of which we hide, Jesus' righteousness, his holiness, his blamelessness as is what God puts before himself so that when he looks at you and I, instead of seeing our sin, he sees Jesus' righteousness as our Lord and Saviour. And so God is always open to us as a result. When we put Jesus where he should be as our Lord, I'm just trying to picture what it would look like for even just a local church, one local church. And I'm hoping this actually exists, what I'm trying to picture. A congregation of people upholding God's name in Christ as holy. It would just be like a make, it should make a radical difference to well, even just will, the vibe of yeah, the place. Yeah, of course. It will mean that people do what Jesus tells them to do. They obey him and the... F- the f- willingly. Will, they willingly obey him. And what that looks like, of course, is what Jesus uh, told his disciples in John 13, that they love each other. They love each other with the same kind of self-sacrificial love that Jesus loved them. They love their enemies. They pray for those who persecute them. And they forgive one another. Later on in the prayer, we'll get to uh, our Heavenly Father, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. A church that is known by forgiveness and generosity would be an outstanding community. Uh, And yet in those two simple ways, God's name would be hallowed on earth as it is in heaven. What about at the at a global level? And I'm still uh, got Philippians rattling around in my mind of that incredible future of this acknowledgement across the world of who Jesus is and the acknowledgement of His name and God the Father's name. All those things wrapping together. But what about right now? Like, how do you think the world may be changed if this at uh, this one this opening line of this prayer was prayed? sincerely, wholeheartedly and often? Well, it would be what it's meant to be and that is a fantastic advertisement of the coming kingdom of God because that's what the church is supposed to do. It's supposed to advertise the coming of God's kingdom. Isn't the kingdom here? Didn't Jesus already say the kingdom has come near, repent and believe when he was the start of his ministry? I'm thinking here about the first chapter of Mark's gospel. The first words which are recorded as coming out of Jesus' mouth when he kicks off his public ministry are at verse 15. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. That's what I'm putting to David here. Yeah, he has established it personally. And so wherever he is, the kingdom is there. He is the kingdom. He's it in the flesh. Uh, and in the power of his spirit, he makes the kingdom present at different times and in different places. When a group of people gather together to read God's word and to confess their sins and to sing God's praises, there's the kingdom. When Christians love one another in Jesus' name, there's God ruling in their hearts by the power of his spirit. But the important thing is to remember that the kingdom always belongs to the king. And so if the king, wherever the king isn't, there's no kingdom in that kind of sense. And so we look forward to the coming of his kingdom, the final return of the king, when Jesus will judge the enemies of God's promises and save his people from the uh, wrath of God. After that tasty teaser about the kingdom of God brought near by Jesus... Be sure to check out the next episode of the Lord's Prayer podcast all about the next line of the prayer, your kingdom come. But to finish up this episode, as we will in every episode, let's end on the note of there's been loads of things to think about and ponder, lots of um, helpful Bible references that we can go off and check and, and, and think about more deeply. But As we head away to do that, what are some final one or two tips you've got for us to help in our prayer life? So this first line, our Father in heaven, your name be honoured as holy. As I come to approach God in prayer, what are some things that I can do right now 
from this line? How, how can it spur me on to deeper, richer prayer life? Well, what we've said is that God's name is hallowed when Jesus is recognised as Lord. And the simplest way, I think, of applying that to our lives is to be, uh, first, we're going to have to be a little bit reflective. We might have to actually have to stop uh, the frantic nature of our switched-on 24-hour lives and stop and think about them for a minute. And as we go through our relationships, as we go through our responsibilities, as we go through our activities, all we need to do is ask ourselves, what does Jesus deserve here? That is, how might I show that he is my Lord in my family, in my workplace, in my leisure time, when I'm with my friends, when I'm with strangers, when I'm with my neighbours? How can I show those people that Jesus is my Lord. Now, we've mentioned a couple of them already. We love one another as Christ has loved us. We forgive our enemies. We pray for those who persecute us. One of the most common ones is just to tell people how good Jesus is. We use another word called evangelism. We may not necessarily be able to take people through a gospel tract, but we should always be thinking, well, what does the Lord Jesus deserve of this relationship? that I have with this person, this activity that I will use with my time, these resources with which I've been blessed. What does the Lord Jesus deserve here? The Bible's pretty explicit in the New Testament on all the different ways that Jesus can be honoured as Lord, which of course means that praying needs to be done in conjunction with listening. (laughs) Talking and listening, we do the listening part as we read God's word. But that simple concrete thing of What does the Lord Jesus deserve here is the shorthand way or is the question, the answer to which will be, this is what it means for Jesus to be Lord in my life at this point in time. And when I live that out in the power of his spirit, God's name will be hallowed on earth as it is in heaven. What does Jesus deserve here? How might I show he is my Lord, the one we worship as we honour the name of God the Father? Let such wisdom shape your prayer life. And David and I will see you next episode for focus on the next part of Jesus' perfect prayer. Your kingdom come. Be sure to share the Lord's Prayer podcast. We hope that this is a resource not only for you, but also for all those you know. And subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can do that via the Hope Media app, hope1032.com.au or wherever you seek and find your podcasts. I'm Ben McKechn. Thanks to theologian David Honey for his wisdom and insights and thanks to Jesus for leaving us with a prayer to shape our very existence. Keep praying and see you next time. Our Father in heaven, your name be honoured as holy. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.